We're back. Welcome to season five of Mintel's Little Conversation. Real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. I'm your host, Andrew Davidson, based in New York. And today we are jumping in on the conversation about chat GPT and the broader topic of artificial intelligence to bring you Mintel's perspective about what it means for brands and marketers. Is this a breakthrough moment or another fad? ChatGPT is what's known as a generative AI chatbot that was developed by a company called OpenAI. It interacts in a conversational way and is very convincing. By the way, the GPT in ChatGPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. We'll get into uh, all of that. Now, ChatGPT exploded onto the scene a couple of months ago, and in the first month, it notched up 57 million active daily users, a faster rate of growth than TikTok or Instagram. It's already being embraced by brands like BuzzFeed, Canva, and Shopify. The most notable brand to embrace it is Microsoft, which, as an investor, recently announced that it will be incorporating ChatGPT into its Bing search engine, a potential game changer. In this episode of the Mintel Little Conversation podcast, we will bring you up to speed and discuss the implications for brands both now and in the future. Joining me on the pod, I'm delighted to welcome our AI experts, Brian Benway from Chicago and Jan Urbanek from Dusseldorf. Welcome to the pod. Hey, guys. Hi there. All right, please introduce yourselves. I'm Brian. I'm the video game and entertainment analyst at Mintel based out of Chicago. Uh, I've been with Mintel since 2017. I'm Jan. I work for Mintel's office in Germany in Düsseldorf. And um, here I'm responsible for writing the tech and media reports covering the German market. And I've been with Mintel for a bit more than three years now. Great. Well, welcome both of you to the pod. Well, let's start off then. Why all the buzz about ChatGPT? Uh, so I think the the big thing that's causing it to take off is how convincing it is, and also the fact that it's free to use for people. Um, like Dolly, you can just go to the website and start typing things in, and it's um, it's so easily incorporated into social media content. Uh, you know, people recording stuff, um, recording their conversations with it, or generating AI generated imagery from Dolly and posting that on their TikTok. It really kind of took off and blew up that way. Yeah, absolutely right. I think um, the major aspect here is, yeah, definitely it is consumer facing. It engages a wide range of consumers and um, holds holds basically some utility for everyone. It's it's really fascinating. Everyone can play around with it, whether it's to create a poem or to create a cover letter. So it really holds something for everyone. And I think everyone using it gets a sense of how, how powerful this tool is and how powerful it could become in the future also when we talk about AI in general. Yes, it really seems to have captured the imagination. Uh, But let's put some context around it. What's the history of AI? How do we get to this point? Yeah, so we've been kind of building towards this point uh, for a really long time, actually, Uh, at least as far back as World War II, when Alan Turing invented the, uh, the Enigma machine crack uh he did that as a way he wanted to create a thinking machine that was his whole impetus behind that design process if you watch the movie the imitation game with um with benedict cumberbatch uh they did a great job kind of going over how he felt about machine learning even as far back as world war ii before we even had computers um he theorized that if a machine could carry on a conversation that was indistinguishable from a conversation with a human being then it was reasonable to say that that machine was thinking and that was in back in the 1950s and i'd say we're we're kind of there you know that's the reason why chat gpt is taking off so well is because you can have a conversation with it and then building off of that you know we we got computers and computers have been iteratively getting smarter and smarter and smarter now video games and we've got chess supercomputers ibm's uh deep blue defeated uh gary kasparov back in like the 90s um and since then no human being has beaten a computer in chess in an actual chess tournament in 15 years so the 
the power of these things is just in it's incredible and during all of this we've had the the iterative work behind the chat bots um starting with the eliza chat bot which i believe came out in the 70s i had the most experience with uh, a chat program called dr spazzo back in the 90s um and this is a an early website that you could go to and it acted like a therapist it would ask you what are you what are your problems how are you feeling today and you could tell it things like oh i'm angry about this and it would respond with some fairly canned responses but it would say things like oh why do you feel that way tell me more and you could tell it like i'm mad at you dr spazzo and it would actually respond with why are you mad at me and these were, were canned responses but they were building up to this so you know this has been a long a long work in progress pretty much since the dawn of computers we've been working to get this way and we've still got further ways to go i'm sure recently meta reported its q4 earnings and talked about a focus on ai for its algorithms clearly ai comes in different forms and has different uses what are some of the key terms or types of ai that we should be familiar with and how do they differ from something like chat gpt Right, that's a good question. But generally speaking, I wouldn't want to go into too much technical detail here. But I think um, the most important thing for our listeners and potentially the users of AI is to take away that, yeah, as you said, AI can have very different use cases and applications. And I think what is important to note is that the the rather traditional AI use cases we've seen so far, and maybe everyone is already familiar with, are typically designed where AI can make predictions and decisions based on data. And I think great examples here are, for example, spam filters. They will take a look at every email that enters your your folder and then make a prediction whether or not this is spam or not. Similarly, you also have recommendation system in e-commerce. So an AI will take a look at the product that you like, the product that you look at, the products that other customers similar to you might look at and then predict what product you might be interested in buying next and what you are most likely to buy. So having said that, the new era and the new AIs we're starting to see now not only make predictions based on data, but they can also generate entirely new content based on data. And one thing is, for example, ChatGPT, you put in text and it can generate entire poems, entire stories, but also code that can be used for developers in IT, for example, which then, for example, can be used to get turned into a 3D object as well in, in gaming, for example. But it isn't necessarily limited to text. Brian already already mentioned Dolly, which is basically a text-to-image generator. So you put in a text, well, let's say, create me an image of a cat wearing a hat, and the AI will generate an entire new image for you. Um, similarly, we have that for video as well. There is this company called Quinvio AI, and it lets you generate videos that show an artificially generated person, basically, and you can tell it what it should what it should explain in the video. So you can use it on your company website, for example, to talk about your products in a much more cost-effective way than it would be possible by hiring a real actor, for example, and much more convenient, you know. But there is also things like audio, text to audio, for example. Apple recently um, started to turn to turn ebooks into artificially intelligence-based generated uh, audiobooks. So they are narrated based on AI. And I think that is something that our listeners should take away from this because all these different types of content formats in combination with AI offer a variety of different opportunities for them. I mean, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, you know, Brian talked about how, you know, we've been at this for for years. Uh, Jan, you're talking about all these different applications, different use cases that are currently in existence. So when you think about ChatGPT then, you know, is it is it hype or is this a key breakthrough moment in technology we're, that we're observing? And, and for, in fact, maybe if you could think about, you know, what technology is this analogous to with this launch of chat gpt well some might even argue that technically not chat gpt is the breakthrough here but rather the underlying technology because that is what made this progress over the last recent years possible which are substantial advances with regards to the algorithms used 
So as a as a fun fact, uh, the T in the GPT of ChatGPT stands for transformer, as you already um, highlighted. And that is actually, let's say, an algorithm innovation, which got published by Google researchers back in 2017. And some describe this as a pivotal element in the development of artificial intelligence that then made applications such as ChatGPT possible. That is what some might argue. But I think it is still a very unique and um, yeah, a very unique and strong application of this technology that offers so much utility for a wide range of, of users that I think both sides are true. It's both that the technology made it possible, but also the application of it is something very unique and strong here. I think from a, a really tangible um, use case, I I would say the in my mind the most uh, equivalent would be the pocket calculator. You know, we were we were all taught in school growing up how to do so much math by hand that as as adults, most of us, I'd argue, probably don't even touch or remember at all because we've got a phone in our pocket that has a calculator function built right into it. We don't need to remember, you know, the Pythagorean theorem and long division when we can just quickly pull out our phone and do it right there. I think AI is going to be like that, but for written communication, for art, for all kinds of other purposes, AI isn't going to replace Stephen King, of course, you know, but it could make his job a lot easier. Um, and we already kind of see that, the application of that on a day-to-day basis with the autocorrect on our phones when we send text messages or we write emails. You know, Google and our different mobile phone carriers are trying to automatically prompt and guess what we're going to say next to help us write text messages. AI is just going to take that and run with it and go further. I really like this analogy because it really taps into the fact that AI fundamentally tries to move like cognitive functions from humans and the brain to a machine, which then get turned into a tool, you know? So I think this, this um, highlights it very nicely. And I think if you, if you want to push this even further and talk about all the, the possibilities that AI and its development might hold for, for us and um, for, for the economy, for example, I would like to make um, the the argument that you could compare it in a way to the industrial revolution and in a way to the steam engine, because in a way the steam engine, what it did, it allowed to move like manual labor to machines, and quite similarly, what we could see going forward increasingly is that labor or parts of labor, certain processes of white collar workers, get also transferred to machines. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, AI could potentially be as big as a steam engine too. Um, it, it remains to be seen how how capable it, it currently is, but it's we're getting there. We're getting there. So we've got the uh, pocket calculator and the steam engine, both pretty significant uh, inventions in the evolution of uh, humankind. All right, so... You know, I, you, I know, Jan, you mentioned how people are trying poems and, and uh, you know, you've got people testing out ChatGPT and I'm no different. When I, It was interesting, though, going in and logging into ChatGPT and when you first log in, it flashes up a number of warning messages about errors, about the potential for misuse and the risk of providing wrong or even harmful information. Various you know, in the United States, various um, boards of education of, of like, like like New York, for example, where I'm from, um, have banned the use of ChatGPT due to the risk of plagiarism. Um, so, you know, help us frame what the ethical issues are and how they might impact uh, brands. Yeah, I mean, AI can really only be as smart as as we human beings are. Um, what it's doing, it's it's scraping the internet for content. It, it's going out there and, and looking for things that it can reference. And this is very much the same sort of thing that, that humans do. Um, as, as an artist, you know, you don't just sit down in a blank white room and paint the Mona Lisa. You, you're looking at, at reference it reference images, you're looking at live people, you're looking at other artists' work to create your own. That's what AI is essentially doing. Um, but that said, there's a lot of junk on the internet. 
um, ethically, AI is is a can of worms that could be so deep we haven't even begun to to understand it. As amazing as the possibilities for it are, the the ethical concerns and the dangers of it could be just as deep. You know, we've seen human beings fall in love with TV characters and try to get married to a TV character. I think someone is eventually going to fall in love with an AI deep fake and try to marry it. <laughs> what do we even do with that as a society? You know, uh, that's definitely a good question, but you also addressed and mentioned biases. And I think biases, the bias chat GPT or other generative AIs have is a, is a very substantial limitation and a substantial issue of those. Um, because yeah, they are trained on data. And if the data is biased in any way, they will pick up this bias initially. But we have to mention that companies such as OpenAI, which are behind ChatGPT, they are well aware of these biases and they are very open in how they're trying to address this. So these, these AIs are trained on large data sets, which can then provide this bias. They can come up with this bias. But what OpenAI, for example, now is doing, they are using human-generated, more narrow data sets to basically beat the bias out of the system. So um, it is an issue now, but since they are addressing it, I think it is plausible to assume that this limitation will be lifted in the future, that we won't have this issue at some point. But obviously, it is an issue at the moment state, so everyone using ChatGPT, every brand using generative AIs, they definitely need to be aware of that and make sure to to have a strict quality control step there and really look, is this output biased or not? Yeah, I mean, so may, one of the things that is quite notable is how, like you say, yeah, and how transparent OpenAI is about these this potential errors and potential misuse. And, you know, as someone who's, you know, I've played around on ChatGPT myself, you know, and anyone who has done will say, well, on the one hand, yes, it's amazing. You can produce this amazing content. But on the other hand, the whole lot of, there's lots that's wrong with what it's generating. Um, and, of course, you don't know what you don't know. So, obviously, that's the concern. If, you're, if, it's, if it's producing wrong or misinformation, you know, how do we police that? How do, we, um, how do we manage that going forward? I actually have a really good example here because recently I was watching a quiz show with a friend of mine. And in this quiz show, they were asking for animals, animal names that exactly have two A's in the name. And I thought, well, that is the perfect question to ask ChatGPT. So I did that, and it came up with a list of, of about 30 animals, but the issue was it didn't only include animals that had exactly two A's in their, in their name, but also some that had only one, none, or even more than two. And that was surprising. So I thought, well, it is such an easy task. Why did it fail? And I thought, maybe mm. my question was, wasn't, wasn't precise enough. So I pointed ChatGPT at exactly the mistake that it did, and said, well, why did you include the emu here? You know, it only has, it, it doesn't have a, an A at all. And it said, well, you are absolutely right. Um, that is a mistake. So it gave me a new list, but it only excluded emu, but didn't apply the, the correction logic basically to all the other, mil, other animals that were wrong as well. So when I pointed it to the gazelle, I said, well, it only has one A. Why did you put it in here? It only excluded the gazelle, but left the rat in there. And that, I think, is a really good example because it's such a simple output. By, you know, you can directly see what the mistake is and you, you can directly see what the, yeah, why the, the output is flawed, basically. But um, that might not be as easily possible if you ask to get a more complex question, you know. You can just spot the mistake, but in other cases, you, you won't be able to tell if it's, if it's wrong or not. And that is also something that people need to be aware of, that it can provide factually wrong, wrong outputs, even in such very simple tasks. So do you think it's right then to just allow everybody to use it, given that it has these flaws? Well, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's, it is still only a tool. And the tool... Every tool is only as good as the person that it wields, and you can do bad things. You can use it wrongly, um, so you need to be aware of the lim limitations here. And um, but if you are, then I think it is mostly fine. You just shouldn't overly trust the results. 
lots of uh, lots of caveats. I know, I know that I I recently read that um, that ChatGPT is considering adding a watermark or some kind of warning or some kind of suggestion that people know that the content is actually generated by artificial intelligence. Yeah, that's a really good point because um, this points to another issue. Because yeah, ChatGPT can implement this watermark and the way they would do it, it is kind of hidden in the way the AI works. So a human eye wouldn't notice it because it isn't something that is visible, but it is rather a pattern of words used. And um, you can then use AI to determine whether this text has this particular pattern of words used. You wouldn't be able to distinguish it, only an AI could do that. But still, that would only then work for this particular AI. If you have another AI that isn't regulated or doesn't have this watermark, then you can easily just produce misinforming content and potentially use it in a harmful way. So staying on the sort of general theme of ethics and and the use of chat GPT, I want to um, share a quote with you. So the investment strategist uh, Rao Paul tweeted, and I'm going to quote, I'm starting to think that the AI moment we are seeing, and in particular ChatGPT, is one of the biggest deflationary shocks in all history, he tweeted. And he followed up, the cost of expertise in many, many cases has just collapsed to zero near instantly. ChatGPT seems to symbolize cost cutting. What's your take? I think the value of cheap opinions Yes. Cheap opinions just became free. You can generate them endlessly. But an expert opinion? No, ab- absolutely not. Um, just like uh, like Jan was saying, uh, an AI can – it's like a, an uncle on Facebook. You can throw any opinion out there on the internet. But an expert should be able to immediately pick that apart, find the flaws in it, and – produce something useful from it um there's going to remain explicit human value in that um and at mintel you know we're we're already we're exploring how we can use it in in our work to make our work better um and there's definitely value to having a human expert oversee an ai i think that the way that it's going to change work is people there will be you won't have someone working with a human manager. The Everyone will be a manager. You'll be a human manager who manages humans, or you'll be a human manager who manages AIs, and the AIs will do the work. You need someone to review that and look it over and make sure that everything is coming out good, and then you're going to have your human manager managing you. Um, but everybody is probably going to be using AIs, whether they know it or not in the future. I like that we've gone from a pocket calculator to a steam engine to an uncle on Facebook as this <laughs> conversation has progressed. No, that's absolutely right. AI is still a tool and you need a human to use the tool. And um, this, the human still needs to decide what to, to use the tool for, what to questions to put into the tool. And yeah, even if you, even if you want to look for something genuinely new, right? Some get, genuinely new insight and ai is basically rooted in the past so coming up with something genuinely new won't be able for an ai you know and that's where you you need the human you need the creative part and you still need to make make sense of the tool and use it appropriately but still i think i think it is plausible to assume that certain skills might shift in value and prioritization yeah um kind of building off of what you were saying there the the power of it to reduce mental overhead i think is is extremely compelling from a from an employee from a worker from someone who does right the 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 way that ai can sort of help you ideate and think about things in different ways that you hadn't thought before. It's like having another person, you know, we've, we've all started working from home so much more and we've lost out a little bit of that human connection where you can't just turn to your coworker next to you and ask it, you know, Hey, what do you think about such and such? What do you think about chat GPT? Well, now you can go to chat GPT and ask it, you know, what do you think about, you know, president Lincoln, you know, and, 
get a, a response that you might not have considered. You might get several responses and you can sort through that information that it kicks out and pick what you find useful. Maybe it'll suggest something that you hadn't thought of that you can use to springboard your ideas and push your content further. Oh, it's interesting, actually, you both, the way you're both talking about it reminds me of a, an interaction I had um, with Apple. So, I, so in, the, in the financial services space, I have the Apple card, and that card is quite unique in that you're, you're able to chat um, through Apple Chat with customer service. And so, um, this is late last year, I was brought, you know, there was a, a, a fraudulent attempt at a purchase on my card that was immediately brought to my attention via this Apple chat, which was initially with a robot, clearly. Um, and within seconds, I was in a dialogue uh, trying to resolve the fact, you know, whether I'd sort of made this purchase at Amazon, which I hadn't. Um, but as soon as the conversation escalated to a slightly more complicated uh, piece of dialogue, I was put on with um, you know a, a customer service representative again via the chat. But in that situation, the the chat bot and the human customer service representative representative sort of you know they kind of work quite seamlessly in that one took it to a certain level and then handed over to uh, to another level. So kind of going back to your point, Brian, about you know humans and um, AI kind of working together to enhance uh, a customer experience. Yeah. The way I see it, it, it basically augments human human work and processes rather than substituting those. And of course, I mean, there is the elephant in the room. Um, if you can make certain processes less time-consuming due, due to AI, is there a potential to, to cut headcount? Because that's the big elephant everyone talks about, basically. Um, and Obviously, there is, but it also depends highly on the industry you're in and on the business model and what you what you really want to make out of it. Of course, if you are limited, for example, by demand, you can't benefit by producing more of your product and certain processes become less time consuming, there is the potential to cut headcount. Definitely, we, we can't, can't hide that. But you can also take it from another perspective and say, well, I could also try to use the freed up time of my, my employees and allocate the resources accordingly that I can imbr- improve the quality of my, of my products, improve the quality of my services, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's interesting that you, yes, absolutely, that is the elephant in the room. Obviously, symbolically, when we've seen companies talk and announce um, the introduction of things like ChatGPT or, or AI, we've seen their stock prices increase, um, which is interesting because it's a good segue onto our next topic. Because, you know, I mentioned in our introduction that Microsoft had announced that it would be incorporating ChatGPT into its search engine Bing. Uh, We subsequently saw Google announce uh, Bard AI, uh, but its share price crashed 10% after it botched the launch. Um, But, you know, surely this uh, could be a game changer when it comes to search that, you know, potentially really shakes up the advertising industry. What are your thoughts around that? Um, so with with Google's launch, uh, the the Google Bard AI, I think part of the the stock crash that they saw there, um, it was really that investors looked at it and kind of saw saw Google waving their arms, going "us to us to look at us to." Um, they announced it so rapidly, and you know when they did their rollout of it, it did make it made some errors. And it it very much looked like a rushed a rushed project. Um, I don't doubt that Google has been working on AI for for a long time, and I know they have been. Um, I don't think they were ready to put it on display yet, um, but I think they they will catch up. They 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 got caught on the back foot, but they've been they've been working on AI. They're going to continue working on AI. Same with Facebook and Meta. Uh, Facebook now meta um, you know they they were trying to promote the metaverse last year and when AI started catching on they kind of poo-pooed it a little bit um, but they're gonna be they're gonna be working and and making AI a part of their part of what they do too uh, it's it's a no-brainer for all of these companies yeah generally speaking including AI in a search engine and making it an assistant for your search has substantial utility for for consumers because 
what it basically does, if you have a really complex question, it can pull all these information you would elsewise have to visit separate websites for immediately in the field that you are typing in, basically. It can pull this out in, in seconds. So it has substantial substantial utility for consumers. And because, yeah, Microsoft came from a place where it has everything to win, basically, in terms of, yeah, who in terms of market share, basically, of the of the different browsers here. I think that got hyped a lot, and I think to a certain extent rightfully. But um, I think what we need to keep in mind here that why BART botched its launch, it did stuff wrong. That same applies for, for Microsoft's Bing AI search. It also, even in public demos, did things wrong. And um, I think we just need to keep that in mind here. And also... While for now, Microsoft might have the head start here because they are much closer to a a public launch. It is still not available to the wide public. It is still limited access. You have to join a waiting list, basically. And I think there is no way in telling if by the time Bing goes fully public with its AI assistance, why Google shouldn't have its own product available. And so far, because both made mistakes, I think there's also no way in telling which of those two will be superior to one another. And therefore, currently, I think it's too early to tell. And I wouldn't necessarily bet all my money on on Microsoft here because, yeah, we just don't know yet. But generally speaking, you address the advertising market. Obviously, the money goes there where consumers can be reached. And if Bing goes substantially earlier public with its AI-enhanced search engine, engine, um, then Google, for example, I guess, yeah, there's a good chance that, that many consumers will switch, at least to, to try it out, and then maybe stick. So, yeah, marketers will have to reallocate their budget accordingly here. Well, it's an interesting development, but we are going to carry on this conversation in the next episode of the podcast. Do listen as I will be asking Brian and Jan about the implications for brands and what's next for AI. In the meantime, head over to Mintel's LinkedIn and Instagram and let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your thoughts. If you want to know more about Mintel, visit Mintel.com and sign up to become a member of the free Mintel Spotlight community. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Goodbye for now and we'll catch you next time for a new episode of Little Conversation.